you know, typically a toddler, maybe around age two, I would say maybe two hours is enough sleep. Some need an hour and a half, some might need a little bit longer. Babies are different, you know, as they're growing, they need more sleep during the day. And then as they get older, um, their naps become a little bit more consistent. So they'll take a morning nap and an afternoon nap at some point. And those are typically up to like an hour and a half in the morning and an hour and a half in the afternoon, Mm -hmm. um, give or take. So that's about three hours a day. Um, You know, so it just it depends on their age. And it depends on other factors in there. So We, but we would work together and we would figure out what is your schedule look like? What needs do you have? You know, are you, listen, you know, if the child is tired at 630 at night, but you're not getting home from work till six o'clock, you're not going to put your kid to bed at 630. You're listening to the Daily Talks podcast where my mom, Deli, empowers parents like you with parenting tips. My mom's mission is to help parents make their child raising experience easier and more enjoyable by sharing valuable lessons to save in unnecessary struggles. The Daily Talks podcast is for any person already parenting or planning on parenting a child. Each week you'll hear different experts talk with my mom about important aspects of parenting, self-care, and of course her specialized area of bullying awareness and prevention. If you haven't subscribed to the podcast yet, go ahead and do so now wherever you may be listening. And don't forget to set up your alerts so that you don't miss any episodes. Let's get started. Welcome back to the Dali Talks podcast. Thank you again for joining me today. I brought a very special guest to come and talk to you, especially if you have a young a little one at home. And if you are having trouble putting them to sleep and you're having those arguments right before bedtime, she's a person to go to. Carla Pearl is a sleep specialist and she's going to help us out with some tips today. Carla, let me start with the first question. How how did you get into this? Hi, Dolly. Thank you so much for having me on your podcast. I'm very excited to be here. Um, so how did I get into this? I am a mom of with three kids of my own. And um, when I had my kids, I was very diligent about setting up routines and schedules for them. And one of the things that I did was keep them on a schedule for sleep. And I found that um, because we did it so consistently right from the beginning, I really didn't have too much trouble with them, um, getting them to bed, keeping them calm. They all had good night's sleep for the most part. You know, obviously things happen, life happens and, you know, whatever. But um, my friends started asking me, like, why is your house so calm? Why are your kids, you know, what? why is it so quiet in your house in the evening? My kids are running around. I can't get them to bed. And I started helping them. And over the years, I realized I've been helping more and more people, friends, family, you name it. And I started thinking I should do something with this. So I took some courses and I was, I became certified as a pediatric sleep consultant and I started my business Slumberland Solutions. And here we are. Yes, here we are. I think like so many of us entrepreneurs, we end up offering something that we at one point did or needed. And then we noticed that, you know, many others need as well. So thank you for that, because um, I can tell you for one that I definitely would have benefited from your services because while my husband had that part, right, I was totally lost. And um, I don't know if maybe it was like a postpartum type of thing where you just feel like you're just, you can't get it together. But uh, (laughs) let's talk about some of the, the, um, Things that you've seen parents struggle with when you're coaching them through the procedures or the the routines. What are some of those things that they do that hinders them from, you know, getting that that thing down right? Well, I don't know that it's that it hinders them. I think when they call me, it's because they realize that something's not working for them or their family. And usually, depending on the age of the child, usually the child is starting to push back on boundaries and limits, or the family just doesn't have anything down consistently. So if, you know, 
bedtime can range anywhere from 7 p.m. to 9 p.m. for a child, or some nights the child can stay in their own bed and other nights they get to sleep with mommy and daddy. That's all very inconsistent for the child and you're not sending a clear message to the child as to what is expected. So I help them, first of all, I help them get on a schedule that's age appropriate so the baby or the child is getting enough sleep. And then I help them establish those boundaries and we work together. Um, I use gentle methods. That's what I call them. So there's not a lot of crying involved, but I help them establish these boundaries. And if the child is crying, we respond to them often. You know, we don't let them cry for too long, but they will cry. Usually it's because they don't like what they're doing. Sorry. And um, they, you know, they're fighting whatever these changes are. So if you understand that your child is crying because they can't communicate and say, I don't like this, then you can understand that they're, you, you can take the crying and you can respond to them. And, you know, I let them every few minutes, you're going to go over and help them. You're not going to let them cry for 15 minutes or something. Mm, okay. I was just going to ask that question. How long <laughs> is too long? Because, you know, there was that mentality uh, of, oh, just let them cry it out. They'll be fine. And then now, yeah. you know, parenting experts are saying, actually, it's not good because it, you know, doesn't uh, help them understand that somebody's there for them to sue them. And, right. Yeah. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, it's, you know, I, you know, I start off depending on the parents and, you know, and I speak to them for a while. So I get a feel for who they are. And, um, I, you know, I try to understand what their, their comfort level is. So if they're very worried about their child crying, then I'm going to say, you know, you're going to be right there with them, let them cry, then you go comfort them. And, you know, we'll determine what a comfortable time frame is, could be two minutes, could be three or four minutes. And we start very short time you know, chunks of time. And then gradually, as everyone's getting more comfortable with it, we lengthen the time. And and eventually, the child stops crying because they, they're more comfortable with it. Your anxiety as a parent, your anxiety level is less. And you've, you've established a new routine. So everybody's more comfortable with it. And, um, and that's where this whole process works. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, what age range do you usually help parents with? Uh, so I start with babies. Um, I can certainly start at the newborn stage. I don't love I, I don't actually train that age. I don't call it sleep training then a, a newborn. They don't need to be trained. They need love. They need comfort. They need you. They need the warmth of your body. So I don't think you can spoil a baby that young and there's no reason to not give them whatever it is that they need at that age. Um, I, what I would do for a newborn parent is help them establish a routine, get them teach the child night difference between night and day. So in the evening, dim the lights, a little bit less noise, change them into their pajamas and start a little routine with them where you may sing to them, read a little story, snuggle with them a little bit, and help them learn how to fall asleep independently in their own sleep space, whether it's a bassinet or a crib, but not in their not in the parent's bed. And teach them, you know, you lay them down, let them fuss a little bit, and once they get comfortable, they will learn how to fall asleep. So that's what I will do for a newborn. As they get older, maybe five months old or so and older, we start working on if they're crying because they're used to being held to sleep. We work on getting them out of your arms into their crib and learning how to fall asleep independently. Mm -hmm. And then as they get older, we work on all of those skills. And if they're toddler age and they're testing boundaries, they don't want to go to sleep. They keep running out of bed. I have lots of tips and tricks and games that you play with them. 
And, you know, so you teach them how, again, it's all about falling asleep independently. That's really good. Um, you know, as you're speaking about the routines and things, I am, I'm, my other question is, how old is, is it too old to help them establish these routines? So I don't think there's ever an age limit on that. I mean, everybody develops habits, bad habits, good habits all throughout your life. So I don't think that you can ever be too old. I'm right now I'm working with a nine year old, which is a little bit out of my wheelhouse, but happy to help the family. And, um, and, you know, so I am approaching it a little differently. I've spoken at length with the parents, but I've also spoken to the child because, you know, he is able to, to communicate and to vocalize and to understand that we can help each other. You know, I can help him and he can tell me what's bothering him and we can work together on it along with the parents. But a younger child, you know, like a three-year-old is not, you know, I'm happy to talk to a three-year-old, but they're not going to be able to verbalize what it is that, you know, I miss mommy or I miss daddy, or I only want mommy and daddy, but they can't understand why. So, you know, with that, in that respect, I'll work mostly with the parents and help them and support them so that they, you know, perfect these skills so that they can help their child. Yeah. Uh, my other <laughs> question is, <laughs> what about families? Because I, we just had um, several homes burn in our neighborhood. Oh, no. um, an electric car in somebody's garage exploded and oh, set, no. up, set off um, the nearby homes. Anyway, um, it, it, so these people are now, you know, it, living with others, other family members while their home is be, re, being rebuilt. And my thought is, how do you how do you do this routine when your child has to sleep in the same room as you? Is is there something psychologically like uh, more challenging there, or is it really impossible? Is it going to make it even harder for them to just move back into their home when it's finished and then just go to the separate rooms? How would you handle a situation like that? So, yeah, so that's sort of um, similar to if you go away on vacation and everybody's in a hotel room together, for example. So depending on the age of the child, if they're in a crib, you can find some sort of partition so that you can put it up between where you're sleeping and where the child is sleeping. A, a sheet, if there's a big closet or a bathroom, maybe not a bathroom, but you know something where you can put the crib and keep it separate, that's very helpful because then it's still a separation and they still feel like they're not with you. Um, if they're older and they're in their own bed and you're in your bed, you know, you can make it a game. We're on vacation or while we're waiting and we're staying with grandma and grandpa, we get to sleep together and it's great. And, you know, we're going to take advantage of this fun, special time. But when we go home, you go to your bed, you go to sleep in your room, I go to sleep in my room and, you know, we go back to normal, you know, our normal lives. The other thing about all of this is if you have an established routine already, no matter where you are in the world, if you're on vacation, if you know, you've had a catastrophe or anything, if you keep that routine as consistent and as possible or as similar as to when you're at home as possible, the routine itself will give that child a sense of um, control over the situation and the newness of their surroundings won't be as frightening to them because the rest, everything else is the same. Mm -hmm. We still took a bath. We still put on our pajamas. I'm still reading my same books. Um, if they're in a crib, you can bring a sheet from home so that it smells like home. If you're, you know, things like that, that just make it a little bit more familiar, then the rest of it shouldn't be as scary for them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for answering that question. I, I was just wondering that because I see that a lot where 
things happen and people have to cohabitate in the same space. And I always right. wonder like, how would that affect the kids? Cause I know it's an inconvenience too, because you have to do things differently when children are inside of your room, like, you know, and yeah. seeing things like that. Um, what about uh, children who um, have fears, you know, like they might say, cause I, I actually think that some kids might maybe, inadvertently do this to manipulate <laughs> but mm-hmm. you know you have some kids that are like oh no I'm really really scared and uh, they may be very very convincing and you don't want to be heartless mm-hmm. but at the same time you're like wait a minute is this kid working me <laughs> so how, <laughs> how do you manage that <laughs> yeah so yes that is very 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 typical um and especially as they they like three four five year olds love that because (laughs) I'm scared. That means mommy and daddy are going to sleep with me and I'm going to get what I want. So one of the tricks that I, um, I suggest to parents at the, around that age is they can get a spray bottle, an empty spray bottle, fill it with water, have the child decorate it or you decorate it together. And I call it a sweet dream spray. So before they go to bed, part of their routine is to go around the room, have the child spray wherever it is that they're scared. I think something's in the corner. I think something's in my closet. I think something's under my bed. Whatever it is, let them spray it. And you're only spraying water. You know, you're not ruining anything. And that gives them a sense of control. It helps them feel that they're conquering whatever it is that they're think that they're afraid of and it helps and it's becomes part of their routine. So it makes it a little bit fun Mm -hmm. and it usually helps because they're, then you're saying like, yes, I acknowledge the fact that you are afraid of something. I'm not saying there's nothing there. I'm agreeing with you. It's scary. Let's do something about it. You're giving them a solution. I love that because you're, you're not invalidating their fear. That's really, really, that's beautiful. And I love that just the idea of like pretending pretty much like, okay, let's go get this bad thing. (laughs) Whatever it is, it doesn't matter what it is. So Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Wow. That I thank you. I'm glad I asked that question. (laughs) And I I think that that would also create that just such a beautiful memory because, you know, eventually they'll grow up and look back and like, wow, mom and dad actually went along with this and help me by doing this. (laughs) That's really (laughs) cute. Um, What about um, kids who need, say, like a security blanket or a stuffed animal? You know, at what age should we allow them to do that? Because, you know, I've heard of things like suffocating in bed because they had a a stuffed animal too close to their face or stuff like that. How, um, at what age should we allow this? So, Typically, from birth to 12 months old, a child should be sleeping in a crib with nothing in it other than the mattress and a fitted sheet. So no blankets, no pillows, no toys, maybe a pacifier or a couple pacifiers if they like a pacifier. Um, You don't need a blanket. You can put a child in a sleep sack, which is like a, a, you know, it's like a a blanket that zips up like a sleeping bag almost on them. And they have age appropriate ones. So for a newborn, their arms are, you know, inside and they're swaddled. As they get older, they can put their arms out and their legs out, but they're completely covered up, up until, you know, up till their chins. Um, That's all you need until they're 12 months old. When they get older, and if they do have a special lovey, they can certainly sleep with it. And a lot of times children like that comfort and it's it um, transitions from their crib into their bed, which is totally fine. There's nothing wrong with sleeping with something. I encourage parents not to allow too many toys in the bed or the crib because that becomes distracting. And I also encourage them to keep whatever that toy is as their sleep toy. So when they wake up in the morning, don't bring it down to breakfast, don't bring it to school, don't bring it other, you know, don't play with it during the day, tuck it into their bed, have the child tuck it in and say, you know, good night to it. And it's going to rest and wait for you. And when you come up to take a nap, or when you go to bed at night, 
whatever it is, is going to be waiting for you. Um, and that way they're going to associate that with sleeping as opposed to a toy that they're playing with all day long. Mm -hmm. So okay. it's, you know, and they're, and I think they're great. They're very comforting. And especially if it's something that the child loves, they're going to feel much more secure going to bed. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that's weird. Growing up, I didn't have anything like that. And I used to see that on TV. And then I had kids and we bought our girls stuffed animals and they each 117, the other one's about to be 16. And they each take their stuffed animals with them everywhere. We've <laughs> It's crazy. Yeah. It, it, they, they really worry as if it's a real person. If they realize they've left it behind, they're like, no, we've got to go back. We've got to go back. Or where is yeah. it? And they have names for them. Um, and it, it is incredible how comfort, how much comfort they feel even now at this age with those. And I look back and I'm like, wow, this is crazy. Cause I thought this was just a, a TV thing. <laughs> it's so <laughs> real. <laughs> so, so yeah. So I, I always, uh, you know, we have people who still think like, oh, you don't need that. And we, we invalidate our children by if we say that to them. Um, and I'm assuming that if you don't let them have that, they're going to find something else, right. To try to grab onto. Yeah. Something. Yeah. 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 And there's nothing wrong with, you know, Mike, you're funny. Your girls are teens. My kids are in their twenties. They still have their toys from when they were, <laughs> And they, they went to college with them and they went to, so it's That's um, so funny. Cause I asked them that, so like, are you going to take them to college? They're like, yes. And yeah. like, but what if you lose it in college? What if your roommate accidentally throws it out because it looks at it and it's like, oh, this old thing. Right. <laughs> I bet their roommate will have one. <laughs> <laughs> Probably. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what about um, sleeping, like the positioning of a baby in the crib? Because I remember when my siblings were small, because I'm the oldest of six. So I remember listening to my parents saying, no, no, lay them on their back. No, no, lay them on their tummy because they might you know, suffocate. So is there a right way? Is, is any of that true? Yes. So babies, again, up till um, 12 months should be put placed on their back. That's a, such a great, important question that you just asked. They, um, so you always put a baby down on their back when they're older and they can move around and they can roll, you can allow them to roll over. You don't, you're not supposed to put them down on their stomach because that um, runs the risk of suffocation or SIDS. And um, so, pediatricians, any child expert or baby expert will tell you place the child on their back. Once they can roll, then they can move around as they're comfortable, but they really need the strength. It's their neck um, muscles need to develop so that they can turn their head. Uh, but if you put them on their stomach and they're not strong enough, they can move, move their head and get stuck. So that's why you want to keep them on their back. Okay. And is there an age that kids um, could, you know, um, I guess, suffer from SIDS? Uh, should we not worry so much until they get to a certain age? So it's, from, you know, from the time they're born. And then one, I, I believe it's up till 12 months, that is the risk. But depending on the child and their development and their muscular development, once they can move, then I believe um, that those risks start to decrease. I'm so glad that you cleared that up because that's that too is, uh, you know, there's always something new, some new discovery that pediatricians find um, about children and people are left confused and they just try to figure it out. Because I remember my husband and I, we would have these nights of paranoia where we would come over and we're like is she sleeping i mean is she is she breathing and we're like watch her <laughs> you know can you can you watch her uh her chest rise you know is it rising but sometimes those darn babies they sleep so well that you can barely see that and we would just be there all night like every five minutes <laughs> you know? i know i know it's so scary it yeah. is so scary yeah. What about um, any type of comforting, uh, 
I guess, phrases or, or something to help them fall asleep before bedtime. Because for, for my kids, a comfort was read a book and tuck them in and we had to give them a kiss. Like if we did not do that, like emotionally, they were just so distraught. It was crazy. So I'm wondering, was that just my kids or is this like something that all kids experience? So that was the routine that you created on your own, which is a great routine. Um, And that's what they came to expect every night. And that's why if you forgot one piece of it, they became distraught because a young child needs a routine and likes everything the same. If you remember when they were toddlers, they probably wanted you to read the same exact book over and over and over and over and over again. They never got tired (laughs) of it because that was familiar to them and that gave them comfort. So if you tuck, you know, read a book, tuck them in and gave them a kiss, that's your routine. That's what they want every single night. So as a parent, you will establish some sort of routine along those lines, whatever you're comfortable doing, reading two books, singing a song, giving them a hug and a kiss, just a kiss, just a hug, whatever it is that you're comfortable doing, but that's your routine and that's what you're going to do every night. One of the things I caution parents, especially as their children become toddlers and a little bit older, keep the routine very consistent, but limit it. You don't want it to run too, too long. So you want to make sure that you're only reading two books. If they want more or they want you to read the same book over and over again, you you very gently tell them, I know you want to read the book. We're going to read it again tomorrow or later or, you know, and you, and you be firm about your response, because if you finally give in what they're learning is, I'll just keep asking, asking, asking until finally I get what I want. Mm -hmm. But if you never give in, then they learn that when mommy says it's enough, it actually is enough. Mm -hmm. So you have to be very clear with your boundaries, clear with what you expect from them and what you're telling them. And if you stick to that, that's what they learn. Okay. That's, that's great because um, the boundaries, you start really, really early. And I think it makes it less encouraging for them to try to push on that. If you start really early. Yeah. Exactly. (laughs) Oh yeah, they're very smart. They catch on really quick. <laughs> very fast. And they yeah. know who which buttons to push. They know who will give in sooner. And mm-hmm. you know, it's I don't know, my, in my house, I guess I was always the one who was very firm with my boundaries and daddy wasn't. And oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I was very um firm about the not sleeping in in bed with us thing and dad was always like oh come on for the most part he followed my you know desire to not have them on on in the bed but he'd surprise me now and then and you know I'd find all three of them in bed or like oh, okay <laughs> I'm gonna move them now and hopefully they won't wake up and you know <laughs> a whole ordeal will, will start from there but um <laughs> But I am sure it happens uh, to, to everybody. Of um, course, of course. <laughs> what about kids who have, because we're talking so much about nighttime sleeping. What about daytime sleeping? You know, some kids, I remember I was so, so sad when my eldest stopped taking a nap um, because I don't know, it was just like uh, all that energy just cooped up in there that I saw and it would just wear both of us down and we're like, oh my God, she did not sleep today. <laughs> Right, that right, means right. we're going to have a really, really long day. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is hard to transition out of the nap. Usually around age three by three, they're usually more or less done with their nap. Um, a two-year-old typically still needs some sort of nap. Um, based on how much nighttime sleep they're getting, you will base their their nap time, you know, the length of their nap as well. So, you know, we figure out how much sleep the child needs, and then we balance the nap with the overnight sleep. Um, You don't want them to get too much daytime sleep, 
So if they're napping and they like to take this really, really, really long nap, and then the parents are complaining, I can't get them to bed before nine o'clock, or they just never wind down, it's because they slept too long during the day. So then we have to learn how to cut the nap, put them to bed at a reasonable hour so that they sleep the night, wake up at a reasonable hour in the morning, and, you know, and so on. As they transition, as they get older and transition out of the nap, that's when, you know, you'll find, you probably remember this, the kids are, you know, it's a long day, the kids break down at like five o'clock, four o'clock, five o'clock in the afternoon, it's like that awful hour. What you can do at that point is maybe just give them, I call it quiet time, up to an hour of just let them just sit quietly, well, depending on the time of day, whether it's a video reading a book, playing, you know, like doing puzzles or coloring or something, just something quiet. Try not to let them sleep because you want them to go to bed at night. But they do sometimes need just some downtime just to rejuvenate and refresh themselves so they don't get themselves too wired and too overtired. You want it's that balance. And it's really tricky as they're outgrowing their nap because their bodies aren't quite ready for it yet, but they need to. Okay, that's that's good to know. What about the nap? You said not too long. What is too long? I remember my kids, they used to sleep between two to sometimes four hours, but they were more on the three hour mark uh, for the most part. Yeah. So again, it depends on the child. It depends on the schedule. It depends on your family. Um you know, typically a toddler, maybe around age two, I would say maybe two hours is enough sleep. Some need an hour and a half, some might need a little bit longer. Babies are different, you know, as they're growing, they need more sleep during the day. And then as they get older, um, their naps become a little bit more consistent. So they'll take a morning nap and an afternoon nap at some point. And those are typically up to like an hour and a half in the morning and an hour and a half in the afternoon, Mm -hmm. um, give or take. So that's about three hours a day. Um, You know, so it just, it depends on their age and it depends on other factors in there. So we, but we would work together and we would figure out what is your schedule look like? What needs do you have? You know, are you listen, you know, if the child is tired at 630 at night, but you're not getting home from work till six o'clock, you're not going to put your kid to bed at 630. You want to spend a little time with them. So we work all that in too, and we figure it out. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. And you know, something that just popped in my head, as you were saying that, you know, the whole Mm -hmm. sleep and the routine, and I think of devices, and I see a lot of parents giving toddlers devices. Are you seeing an issue with this or a big use of this at at this early in age? So depends when they're being used. Um, There's nothing, listen, we live in a world of screens, so you're never taking them away. And I don't have a huge problem with it. The studies that I've seen show that you shouldn't give screens too close to bedtime. So a rule of thumb could be, no screens after dinner. And it's just simpler that way. It's, you know, for the whole family, no screens after dinner. Before dinner, if you need some quiet time and you want to, you know, watch a video, that's okay. But after dinner, no more videos. That's not the way we go to sleep. You know, you don't lie in bed and watch a video, rather read a book together or do something a little bit more interactive. And um, I think that would help. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, thank you. I was on your website, slumberlandsolutions.com, and I saw that you have a lot of resources uh, to include some workshops. Can you tell us a little bit about those workshops and who they're for? Sure. So I have one of the workshops I do. It's a social skills class. Um, it's called KISS, Kids Social Skills. And that one is geared for ages four to seven. Um, I have a class for pre-K which is the four or five-year-olds. And then I have a class for kindergarten through second grade. And we just work on different situations 
where, you know, your child might um, not really know how to respond, or if they're having trouble acting out at home or in school, we go through these different scenarios. We read books, we play games, um, and we talk about it. So like, you know, for example, one of the books that I use that I happen to really like, it gives different scenarios um, for all these and different endings for each scenario. So for example, it, the beginning of one of the books starts where the little girl comes down to breakfast. She has a baby brother and an older sister. And the baby brother is sitting at the table eating breakfast and the sister wants to sit next to the brother. And the little girl comes in and says, no, I want to sit next to him. So then you ask, so the book asks, should she push her sister out of the way or should she go find another chair? <laughs> and then we talk about it. And what should we do? What happens if? And then the book goes on. If you say, oh, she's going to push her sister out of the way, then you go on to see what happens when she pushes her away and, you know, and you keep going and we talk about it and why wasn't that the best choice to make? And, you know, what could she have done differently? And, you know, and so it's really good because it's, real life situations for them or or you know or scenarios that they can imagine and we talk about it and it really helps them figure out these are the ways that you're supposed to respond and this is what happens when you don't respond this way because there might be you know repercussions to it or so yeah so that's one of the workshops i also help parents with behavior issues you know if they're kids have behavior issues. And, you know, we talk about all that and how to help the child get through whatever challenges they're going through. Yeah, I see that you have a lot of really, really great resources. Um, so what about uh, parents who want to work with you? Uh, should they have anything uh, ready for you aside from my child's not sleeping? What what do I do? Anything that you require them to have before they set up an appointment with you? They don't have to do anything other than just say, I need help. Um, so what I suggest doing usually is if, if a parent reaches out to me and says that they're having trouble, we set up a call and we talk to each other and I try to help them identify what the actual challenges are. And we talk about different solutions to it. And if it's something that they feel that they want to go forward with, then we go forward and we, um, you know, dig a little bit deeper and I'll create a sleep plan for them. It's a, you know, it's very customized. Each child is different. Each challenge is different. Um, so we, you know, I identify all of that. I'll create the plan for them. We, I do um, all of this by phone or FaceTime. You know, I don't need to necessarily go to the family's home. So I can really do it anywhere in the world. Um, and then we set up an another call. We go through the plan in detail. We talk it through. They ask me any and all questions. And um, I'm, you know, before we're done, I make sure that they're comfortable with what they're doing on night one. They have a plan. They know how they're going to respond if the child is crying. They're if they're toddler age and they climb out of bed, we know what we're going to do to get them back to bed. And we talk it all through step by step by step. And then I work with them for two weeks. And every day we talk, we text, we talk. It's a combination of things as much or as little as they need. I'm there for them. And we work it through. And usually within the first less than a week, but let's say the first week or so, there's a big improvement. And then the second week, we're just really fine tuning everything. Mm -hmm. And then they're off and running. <laughs> That's, uh, that's awesome. And I saw that you have different packages too available on your website, along with pricing. That way people know exactly what they're getting. Exactly. Um, is there uh, anything else that you would uh, want people to know um, if they want to reach out to you? Um, they, I, If anybody has any questions that they're not sure that they need to sleep train their child or they're not sure what sleep training really is, call me text me, ask me, I am happy to talk to anybody. I don't always, um, not everybody needs to 
work with me. Sometimes they just have a question or they just need to tweak something and we can talk about it and do it from, you know, like it's one phone call. It doesn't cost anybody anything. It's just a few minutes of both of our time. And I'm happy to do that because a lot of times, you know, you have a good handle on it, just something changed and you're not sure what to do. And that's, you know, not necessarily that I don't feel is the need to, you don't have to hire a sleep consultant to create this whole big plan for them. You just need to tweak something. Mm -hmm. So never be afraid to ask. And if it's more than that, then we go from there. Awesome. That's wonderful. I'm glad that parents have you as a resource because I have seen, I've literally seen parents just cry because they just don't know what to do and their child is not going to bed and they're exhausted and um, it's just not a very good position to be in. I think I did that once or twice. <laughs> it's it's foggy now because it's been so long, but um, I do remember feeling that sense of desperation because my older one got to a point to where she just would not go to sleep and it was so challenging, you know? Uh, so <laughs> I hope that parents take advantage and give you a call. I know that you have a free 15 minute consultation that they can book through your website. Now, again, I'm going to repeat it so that people follow it. It is slumberlandsolutions.com. And are you on social media? I am. It's all slumberland solutions. Um, so I'm on Instagram and Facebook. And um, you can all certainly. reach out that way also you know dm me or and i will see it somewhere so yeah great thank you so much for sharing your wisdom your knowledge um and for helping parents because i know we need it especially in this it just seems like it's chaotic the world there's so much that parents have to deal with and uh hopefully you help them especially the the, the newbies that are um you know bringing these little babies in and Hopefully you're making it easier for them. And uh, again, thank you so much for sharing. That's the goal. But thank you. Thanks so much for having me. Anytime. I hope that you took away some great uh, golden nuggets from Carla. Her website is Slumberland Solutions and her handle is Slumberland Solutions as well. And, you know, if you're a parent struggling with your child going to sleep, she is definitely the person to go to. And if you still cannot say you can't afford to uh, hire her, check out her blog, check out the information that she has on there. I also want to invite you to leave a review wherever it is that you're listening to this podcast. Reviews are very, very valuable. It helps other parents uh, understand or get an idea of what to expect from this podcast. And I want to just thank you because you're tuning in, you're sharing, and some of you are leaving reviews and that means the world to me. Thank you so much. Hey, did you like that episode? If you did, be sure to subscribe to this podcast wherever you may be listening and write a review. If you want more tips or some behind the scenes videos, make sure to follow my mom at Dolly Talks on Instagram. You can turn on notifications for her posts and stories as well. Thank you so much for listening to this podcast. See you next time.